reason why the entrepreneur is an important uh, type of person to be part of the church is because the church needs all kinds of people. Right? And entrepreneurship is an essential part of it because the church in, the, in its original form was an entrepreneurial church. The church uh, was entrepreneurial because it was nascent. You know what nascent means? It's newborn, new. Right? When something is new and something is exciting, people just, just go with it. and It's almost like a, a wave and a movement rather than an instant. It was a pre-institutional thing. With thing, the funny thing about institutionalizing anything, and you can institutionalize a company, right, or you can institutionalize a religion, is that when you institutionalize that, it goes from a movement to an institution, people stop thinking so much about the great thing, the great idea, or the great value that was present that pushed it in the original form, and start thinking about protecting the organization. Does that make sense? And what happens is people start thinking more about the organization is more important than the value that there was originally there. So in the church form, what happens is you, the, the, you can see in the book of Acts, this church that was so excited about the Holy Spirit moving and healing and changing and transforming and bringing people back from the dead and, and just doing incredible stuff that it was entrepreneurial by nature. People went from that and started just sharing. It was completely organic. There was not a lot of structure there was not a lot of hierarchy. It was just entrepreneurial. It just flowed, right? And then a few, a few hundred years later, it became institutionalized. Slowly but surely, it became about the organization and who is boss and who is more important in the organization and how to protect the organization. And some of those desires are actually good desires, how to protect something from, let's say, heresy, right? But it takes the life out of the, of, of the very thing that gave it birth. Does that make sense? So the early church was in a very fascinating way, if you look at it, how it spread and how it moved and how it flowed. And we can learn a lot from it, right? Um, and what happened is, you know, we think, well, the, maybe the book of Acts, it was sort of a, a pre-institutionalized church and it was alive and it sort of moved around through trade routes and people planted churches in some of them, we know who planted them, but many of those churches, we have no idea who planted them. They were just disciples. Disciples moved there because they had to move there for whatever reason, and they spread the gospel, and they made disciples, and there was a church. So one of the most important early churches eventually was, became Rome, right? Like now it's the Vatican, right? Uh, and we actually, to this day, are not sure who planted the Roman church. We just don't know. There are theories around about it. That's how entrepreneurial the church was. And we might think, well, they, those days are gone, and, uh, and the church has been around for 2,000 years. What can make it entrepreneurial? And I think my theory is that it's not really about how old sort of the movement is, but how you treat it in the now. How do you understand the nature of what we're doing here that makes it alive and entrepreneurial, and it can make it viral because it's transformative, right? The church that I was uh, baptized into and that, that gives me hope because I was baptized into a church that was like four years old in the making. It was planted by a group of like 17 people. And this church was, you know, in a third world country. And most of the people that were converted was, were first generation Christians. Basically, they never read the Bible before. And somehow the, the, the spirit was upon them and people got baptized and, and, and moved and, and changed their lives and repented. And then it became this entrepreneurial enterprise. It was, a, it was this movement, really. And you could see a lot of similarities. I remember being baptized into it and going, what on earth is going on? All these really random different people are becoming disciples and obeying Jesus and transforming and repenting. And now they're being so generous with their lives and they're studying with other people and they're influencing uh, people in their workspace, in their campus. And, you know, like you were baptized and like literally two, three weeks later, somebody would invite you to lead a, a Bible study. And you would go, I've never read the Bible before. People would go, don't worry about it. Just watch us do it. You do it next time. That's entrepreneurial, right? That was very fluid. And literally, you were expected maybe three, four months after you became a Christian to lead your own small group because somebody needed to do it. And that somebody was you. You were voluntold to do stuff. Right? So there, and we had people, remarkable people, heroic people, uh, that were like, well, you know, we're growing so fast, we should probably evangelize this other city over there. 
And people would leave their jobs, leave their careers, and would sacrifice everything and go to a place that it, sometimes it's, it was distant, sometimes it was less comfortable. In some extreme cases, there was civil unrest there. People moved to mus the predominantly Muslim popular areas. And they did that in a, in a remarkable move from the Holy Spirit. And that was the church that I was, that I was baptized in. And, and, and that's part of the reason why I became sort of sold into this thing, you know, of, of, of this powerful Holy Spirit-driven uh, a church, and I, could, and I could leave a lot of the things that, that were comfortable for me to, so that I can preach the gospel, right? So the reason I tell you all these stories is because that's how it was. That's what we see in the New Testament. Now, the story that I was about to, uh, I'm about to tell you is about this one woman. Her name was Lydia. And there's only three verses of, around her, actually four. There's another one at the end of that chapter. And uh, the, 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 the story behind that it was Paul... The Apostle Paul and his entourage, he has a few guys with him, was traveling, and he, he would go on these entrepreneurial um, missionary journeys, right? Like he would go, here's, we'll get on a ship over here and move over there, and then whatever happens there, we don't know exactly what's going to happen, right? He didn't know whether people would believe or not believe, whether he would be flogged or stoned, or hey, and, and, and the whole experience, if you read the book of Acts, it's really amazing. It's a story of entrepreneurship, of of Christians going from one place to another and just saying, we have this amazing thing called the kingdom of God. And Jesus brought it to us. And will you believe us? And sometimes people, people overreact in both directions. In one direction, they would, people start worshiping them at one point, saying they were gods. And they're like, okay, you're misreading the message here. Okay. And then in other places, they were persecuted, Right. So it's completely all over the place. And that, if you're an entrepreneur in the house, can I get an amen that that's the entrepreneurial journey? Amen. Yes, indeed. It's up and down and up and down. So, so they were going, they're going on the second missionary journey, and they would cross over from what was known here in the middle as Asia, Asia Minor to now Greece. And the second uh, city over there is called Philippi. That's where they went. And that's where the story starts. Uh, so... Um, in Acts 16, 13, this is what it says. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. So just, I want to stop there for just a second because it's really, it, it shows even the nature of how things went, went down, right? He would show up in the city and they would look around and they would, okay, what's the, what, what are the, what are the people who are most likely to listen to us right away? And for Paul, in that season of, of things, it was the Jewish congregation. It was the diaspora, what they call the diaspora. And the diaspora would, mean, would meet at a synagogue. So he would look for a synagogue. And in this case, there was no synagogue. And so most likely, the Jewish population in Philippi was not, didn't have enough critical mass so that they could have a synagogue. So what they would do is they would meet someone somewhere out there and that place, in this particular case, would be the river. Because we thought maybe we'll find our people over there. And that's exactly what we did. They didn't stay home. They didn't go, oh, oh whatever. There is no place to go for us. I, I guess we move to the next city. No, they went looking. And instead of just going there and doing their own little worship service, being all insulated, they saw a group of women. And just to give you a, sort of a little bit more of context, you know, men, especially of, of the Jewish kind and of the Pharisaic kind culturally, didn't really hang out with women that were not their wives that much at the time. So they saw a group of women, instead of doing their own worship service, they, they hang out with the women. They start talking to them, and that's what, how, it, how, it, uh, how it went down. So in the next verse, it describes what happened then. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira, named Lydia. She was a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. So, and what, what this is, there's so much information here, you know? Like if you think about how can you do a sermon in three, in three verses? There's a lot of information in three verses. So first of all, the cool thing was that she was uh, an entrepreneur. And she, if she was an entrepreneur, what, what it means is that they might, she most likely than not, because of the society she was living in, was um, 
inherited her business from her husband. Maybe she was a widow. It's unlikely that she had started it, but it's very likely that she inherited it. Now, this doesn't take away from the entrepreneurial spirit of this woman, and you will see why in a second. But the cool thing about what, who she was and, and what she did was that if you, you, know, you go purple cloth, whatever, you know, how can you be a dealer of purple cloth? Well, at the time, purple cloth was one of the most expensive things you can ever buy, right? Um, it's, like, it's like basically she owned a Versace franchise because it was a status symbol, right? And it was a status symbol for a very good reason. We actually have very few clothing items in, modern, in our modern co context that would even compare. Because to create a purple dye, the purple dye that went into these, these cloths, uh, it was extracted from a little uh, murex snail. It's called a murex snail, right? And every snail would have, this is the snail, and you would have like, they would extract a few drops of liquid that would, in contact with, with oxygen, be, be, turn purple. And you would require 10,000 of those snails for one robe. 10,000. As a matter of fact, the dye that was extracted from the snails you can, you can buy the dye. The dye was worth its weight in silver. So imagine how expensive that stuff is. It was extremely expensive. It's one of those items that you, you go into like a Paris, right, or, or New York City, and you walk by the window and you go, yeah, that would be nice, but that's like never going to happen. That's, you know what I'm saying? Have you ever felt that? Have you felt like, I really like that outfit, but yeah, that's not going to happen. It's that, it's that kind of stuff, right? So, so this woman had inherited this, or maybe started it, perhaps, but she was running this business that was, a, that was a powerful business. And this is what happens then. When she and her members of her household were baptized, and this tells us a little bit about who she was as a person. She invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. So you can, even, you can see the insight. First of all, in those times, if you're a woman, you don't stand out too much, you don't speak up too much, you don't influence too much, and this woman was a powerhouse. Because just in passing, she says she believed, next step, her whole household gets baptized. Who's the boss? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Who's the boss? And then on top of that, what happens is she talks to these powerful men. I mean, these are men that would go into a city and transform the city and cause either an a, a, a grow, a explosive growth of a church or cause an, a riot. These were serious dudes. And this woman talks to Paul and says, if you believe I'm a believer, you will stay at my house. She persuaded them. You can, you can even sense who she was as a person. That's a powerful, godly woman. And we actually don't even know. It says there that she was a, a, a lover of God. And, and the language basically is not precise enough because it doesn't necessarily mean that she was a Jewish believer who was worshiping by the river, or she was maybe a Gentile who sympathized with the Jewish faith and was there sort of, you know, a liker of, a liker of the faith, you know, it, and it's fine to be a liker of the faith. You can be, you know, the president of the, of the Jesus fan club, but not be a follower. Do you agree with that? And she might be that person. And it's clear that her, it's clear that her heart turned. And she became a very different person. Now, here I'm going to give you a list of reasons why an entrepreneur is an important part to be part of this, of any group, and this group in particular. There's, a, there's, a, there's some qualities that are brought into the family of God from an entrepreneur. Here's one. Uh, a transformed entrepreneur is humble because she or he will submit to Jesus. And a non-transformed entrepreneur usually is not super humble. Like, I know that about myself. I've been an entrepreneur since I was like 23 years old. And I remember the before. Very opinionated, right? Very, very opinionated. Don't listen too much. Um, and you can tell, you can see that from Lydia because her status did not prevent her from becoming a Christian, from repenting of, uh, of her sins. The second quality is persuasiveness, Right? She is persuasive. I mean, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to persuade people that what you have is important, that it has value. Does that make sense? The third one is that she is, or he is creative. Um, she has interesting solutions to things. 
Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you need to be able to know how to hustle. How do you make things happen, right? If things don't go your way, how do you think they make things happen? It's fascinating because she convinces them to go into their house, right, and go, you have to stay with me. Please, you have to stay with me. And when you talk about the house, it's probably a villa, a very large house, like a Roman senior level person house. And I can imagine that something happened in that house. There's got to be strategizing happening in this house. Okay, Paul, Silas, what do you have in mind? Tell me. Maybe I can contribute to this thing. That's what it was. That's what it, there was a creativity to the person. Then they're, they're also generous, right? If you are transformed, you become a generous person. If you're not transformed, I was not a generous person at all. You know, before I became a Christian, when I became a Christian, one of the things that I was taught early on is tithing. And it was completely counterintuitive to me. I'm like, this is all my money. I worked really hard for it. It's all mine. And I was told that, first of all, it's not all mine. And second, that none of it is mine, actually. <laughs> Man, that's a, different, that's a different paradigm right there, you know? You know, so it's a fascinating exercise and a shift that happened. And if an entrepreneur is really, truly transformed, he or she becomes incredibly generous. As a matter of fact, that some of the language that is used in, in, this, in this whole story suggests that she, might, she may have become a patron to the mission. And at the time, this idea of uh, patronage was a, was a common idea, is that if somebody become very, sort of came on board, somebody with means or influence, they would put their means and their influence in service of the mission. So it, the, the, the language indicates that Lydia might have become, maybe she financed the rest of the trip, maybe another trip. We don't know that. But there's a high likelihood that that's what happened. Also, entrepreneurs are relational. Right? Um, because if you want to make any idea grow, you want to get along with people. You want, to, you want people to believe and buy into your vision. So you have to be relational, right? And you can tell that because she said, because how she turned around and said, you will stay with me. That's an interesting, that's a very interesting proposition, for, for especially, especially for any person talking about an apostle, right? And second, because she is a woman. And it's fascinating to me because I, I can imagine myself being in the presence of somebody so powerful and so intimidating, like, you know, humbling, not intimidating, but humbling to me. Like if I would encounter, you know, the Apostle Paul making things happen in downtown Austin and I would have met him, I would have probably said, just, hey, can I give you a ride to your hotel? You know, maybe that would be the most of my faith, right? But she was like, no, no, you're staying at my house. This was what's happening. And lastly is that entrepreneurs are gritty. They have grit. And the reason is because grit is a necessary quality to building anything. If you build anything, you will go through hardship. You will go through trials. You will not be faced by difficulties. And you need people that have that quality to themselves so that they can influence the church. Right? If you, have you ever built a company, raise your hand, or a career of any kind, and a family, that's an entrepreneurial exercise right there. You know what I'm saying? Raising kids. Nothing good that you do will ever be easy, ever. There's no shortcuts, and there's no options around that. It is hard. So you need to develop a quality of, of this grit, if you, if you want to make things through. And that needs to infuse the church because the church will go through troubles sooner rather than later, right? Um, so it's fascinating how you can see that because right after the story transpired, uh, they, 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 you, know, there's, you, know, you go, oh, that's a great story. That's a happy ending. It's not a happy ending because in Philippi, literally they didn't even see, leave the city before there was a mutiny of some sort, a revolt, and they were thrown in prison. Right there in that city. And if you think about it, it's not, it's not a city the size of Austin. You know, the only city in the ancient world the size of Austin right now was Rome. In the world. There's no other city that big. So an, an average city would probably be 50,000 people, maybe. If you, th if you think about 50,000 people, you know most, most, you've seen most of them if you live there for more than a year. So everything is pretty interconnected. So if the people that became your best friends who baptized you, your new leaders in the faith, are thrown into jail in your city, are accused of stuff, 
a lot of people are mad at them, right? If you don't have grit, the next thing you do is like, I don't know these people. Because it's going to influence your business. It's going to influence your trade, your status, the way you're perceived by people in a small community. And next thing you know, right after they're released from, we can actually talk about that story probably next, from jail, the, 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 at the very end of that chapter, if you, if you read it, they leave, the, they leave the, the jail and they're trying to regroup and figure out what to do next. Where do they go? They go to Lydia's house. And I bet Lydia was like, oh, don't worry about it. It's all good. Let's plan what's ahead. Does that make sense? So all of these things are amazing. And I think the qualities, the beauty of the church is that God created every single person in this room with a set of qualities that is vital for the health of the church. Isn't that amazing? So an entrepreneur has a role. An entrepreneur can be understood or misunderstood, embraced as an essential part of a community, or marginalized. And what we want to do is we want to embrace entrepreneurs in this community, just like we want to embrace every other gift set. Because we understand that all of us collectively make the church what the church is. The church is and should be entrepreneurial. It doesn't matter that we've been around for 2,000 years. What matters is how do we treat things now? Like if we're, if we're, are we pre-institutional or institutional? And I want to be part of a church that is pre-institutional. I don't want to expand a lot of effort in protecting you know, a set of rules or a hierarchy of any kind. What I want to do is elevate the gospel. But I, but if we, and if we are passionate and burning with zeal for the transformative quality of Jesus Christ, we will be entrepreneurial and we will flow freely and we will be inventive and we will be gritty and we will be generous and we will plant churches and we will share the gospel wherever we go. And a big part of this is elevating the role of the woman in the church. And it's amazing. To us, this is so normal. To us, it's so normal to, to see a prominent, powerful woman of God. But back then, it was, it was absolutely crazy. And we have uh, Priscilla and Chloe and Lydia and Afia and Nympha and uh, the mother of John Mark. And we have countless women that are mentioned in the New Testament that were important, prominent, powerful, influential in the church. And they're not even named. And I think we need to really grasp from that that Jesus at all times, even from 2,000 years ago, all the way to today, is a, the God of the woman and of the man and of the Jew and of the Gentile and of the slave and of the free man and of the poor and of the rich. And all of this, all of these people, all of these qualities are essential to the health of the church. So as we take uh, communion right now, the Lord's Supper, I want you to consider... If, Meditate on this one question. Can we meditate on one question? Am I willing to engage and actively seek transformative life? And the reason I want to emphasize transformative is because that's what matters. It's not as important what church do we go to and what leader do we follow. It's not that important. What's important is that if we connect in a church setting, that it transforms our lives and that we are used to transform other lives. And that takes a lot of intentionality, a lot of risk, a lot of passion, a lot of heart, a lot of pain. And the, the question for us and for, for, for me, as I take this, this cup that represents the blood, the chance that Jesus took on me, and this bread, the body that was torn so that I can live a transformed life, is can we be transformative as well? Let's pray.